Futurist and best-selling author Ray Kurzweil was one of the keynote speakers at the National School Boards Association's annual Technology and Learning Conference in November. At the higher education trade show called Educause earlier that month, eSchool News editor and publisher Greg Downey sat down with Kurzweil to discuss his idea that the rate of change in technology is accelerating at an enormous pace and what that means for the future of education. You've written about a technological singularity that will occur in this century. 2045, I think, is the last prediction I heard. Uh, in fact, you devoted a whole book, The Singularity is Near, to that topic, but can you summarize for our audience what you mean by the singularity and describe its primary implications for education? Well, there's a few underlying themes that have to be described. One is that information technology is growing exponentially. It's doubling its power every year. And it's true computers, but it's also true of software, it's true of every other aspect of information technology. And we are ultimately going to gain the hardware, the computational power to simulate the human brain. And we're also going to gain the software of how the human brain works. From scanning the human brain, we now actually can see individual neural connections in the brain for the first time. The spatial resolution of brain scanning is doubling every year. And the amount of information we're gaining about the brain is doubling every year. And we're actually showing we can turn all that profusion of data into working models and simulations where we can actually describe how a brain region works in precise mathematical terms and simulate it in a computer that's been done already for 20 regions of the brain out of the several hundred that exist. So by the late 2020s, we'll be able to have a computer system and a software system that is powerful enough in both the hardware and software sense to simulate human intelligence. Well, it can often seem odd to speak of accelerating intelligence. Do you draw a significant distinction between intelligence and wisdom? And if you do, do you see any acceleration of wisdom to match the acceleration of intelligence? I do, actually. Uh, and if you watch CNN and the news, you might get the impression that there's a lot of irrationality in the world, which is true. But we now get a front row seat on all the irrationality and all the destruction. I mean, there might have been a battle in World War II where 20,000 people died, but you didn't see that in your living rooms. Maybe you saw it on a great news reel a few weeks later. Uh, there actually is a decrease in war, a decrease in deaths in war. It's not down to zero, and it's not where we want it to be, which is zero. But uh, there is a great democratization movement. I predict in the 1980s that the Soviet Union uh, would basically be swept away, or totalitarian control would be swept away because of this emerging decentralized electronic communication. And I wrote that in my first book in the 1980s, and that's exactly what happened. And we've had this great wave of democratization through the 90s at the political level and at other levels of society. Now, there are some notable holdouts, but if you go back 50 years, there were only a handful of democracies in the world. We really have made a lot of progress. And we have this, we talk about wisdom, there is a wisdom of crowds. Now, crowds aren't always wise. You can have mob reason, which is not very wise. But there are ways of actually tapping the wisdom of a crowd, which can be much greater than any of its individual members. Google is based on that concept. You don't have the Google librarian saying, no, this will be the first link, and that'll be the second link when someone searches for nanotechnology. No, it's done through a self-organizing method based on what everyone else does, what everyone else has searched for, and all the links of all the sites. It's basically harnessing the wisdom of crowds, and there's been a lot of literature on how a crowd, if, if, if the information is tapped correctly, can really uh, create greater insight than any one individual. Blogs are like that. Any one blog is unreliable, but the whole blogosphere actually can uncover the truth of, of, a, of an issue uh, in ways that uh, weren't feasible before we had that uh, wisdom of crowds. And that's what these computer networks facilitate, by being able to tie together communication links, millions of people. The democratizing effect that technology is having on society also applies to the creation of knowledge, Kurzweil said, and this has important implications for education. It used to be if you wanted to create a recorded album, a movie, a important piece of software, you had to be a big corporation, a big agency, or get the resources of that. That really did not enable, let's say, kids in the dorm room to do fully creative work. But now with a PC, you can create a full quality 
motion picture, a recorded album. A couple of kids in their dorm room at Stanford created a little piece of software. It's now worth $100 billion as you use to search the internet. Google, so really yeah. the tools of creation are, are democratized. Uh, we're also making educational materials and courseware and courses and lectures available worldwide. And, and I'm on the board of MIT, my alma mater, and we have an open courseware program to provide all MIT courses available for free on the internet. And already you have classes in Pakistan and Nigeria and China where kids gather around a computer with a facilitator and take an MIT course. And uh, not for MIT credit, but for local credit, but they're getting the courseware. This will soon include also the actual streaming lectures uh, in, the, in the lecture halls. And as virtual reality gets more and more compelling and realistic and lifelike, ultimately there won't be a significant difference between being there in the classroom and having all of this information available on the web. So really everyone, ultimately in many different languages, are going to have access to the highest quality of education from pre-kindergarten through postgraduate. But I think an educator really is going to be a mature guide that can guide you through the world of knowledge, which itself is growing exponentially, doubling in size every year, uh, but not necessarily having to spoon feed uh, one by one every child with that information. There's going to be many online resources to do that. That's it for this edition of Tech Watch. Join us next month for a look at NASA's new vision for education, as well as more EdTech news from around the nation. For eSchool News, I'm Dennis Pierce.